Hi there, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan, and today we're going to put a bunch of kids into a pot and boil them and turn them into glue. Huh? The beauty of the Star Wars galaxy is that it's full of such a large diversity of alien races. It's not like I like aliens. I don't. Most of them are degenerates. But the presence of a larger galactic community forces humanity as a species to come to terms with the fact that we are culturally and genetically very similar to one another. It means that humans and Star Wars generally judge each other as individuals and not by their race or whether they use Apple or Android. It's a beautiful future that we might one day enjoy here on Earth as long as our world leaders can figure out how to stop fighting each other and focus on the real menace below the waves. Hashtag humanity first. Thanks to the genetic diversity in the Star Wars galaxy, there are some species that are far better at certain things than others. Today I want to specifically look at aliens who are really good at one thing, assassinations. While assassins are generally talked about with fear and loathing, they serve as an important part of any space opera, because sometimes the death of one can save the lives of the many. One of the better moves by Disney was bringing back some of the content that was originally made by Timothy Zahn in the Legends era. He's most famously known for creating the Thrawn trilogy, an extremely popular collection of books that is rumored to have inspired George Lucas to come back to the fold and create the prequel trilogies. Thrawn was beloved for his cold rationale and analytical abilities. He was a different type of villain. Far more interesting than your usual one-dimensional evil space wizards. Now, wherever Thrawn went, you could be sure that there was at least one Nogri shadowing him from a distance. Now, originally, the Nogri and Legends were a very peaceful group of people who lived in a primitive society based on agrarian activities and also hunting. During the Clone Wars, a battle was fought on their home planet of Hungor. A separatist ship containing the toxin Trihexalophene 1138 had crashed onto the planet. It released this terrible toxin, which destroyed the majority of the planet's vegetation. Darth Vader, who was impressed by the locals' fighting abilities, offered to give them Imperial environmental aid in exchange for their service to the Empire. What resulted was the creation of the Nogri Death Commandos, made up of most of the able-bodied males on the planet. Little did they know, Vader purposely kept the Nogri homeworld just poisoned enough so that they would continue to rely on their services. But how necessary that was is debated. Like the Wookiees, Nogri society revolved around honor. And in a sense, the entire species owed Vader a great debt for their assistance. As a matter of fact, even after Vader was gone, the Nogri would go on to serve Princess Leia, who they called Lady Vader. The Nogri were short and stocky, but incredibly powerful and agile. They possessed extremely quick reflexes and were terrific at keeping themselves unseen. They also had an excellent sense of smell and were able to identify a person's bloodline by scent alone. Although the Nogri Death Commandos were trained to use advanced technology like starships and blasters, they usually preferred using knives and fighting sticks to take down their enemies. The Nogri were so strong that they were able to take down much larger Yuzing Vong warriors in hand-to-hand -hand combat, even if they're wearing their famous crab armor. The Nogri were a perfect blend of stealth, combat ability, and explosive power. This made them incredible at becoming commandos and also death squads for the Empire. The Claudites, however, were all about blending in. Think Ethan Hunt from the Impossible Mission Force, but instead of having to create 3D printed masks, the reptilian Claudites could just change their faces naturally with their shape-shifting ability. There were, however, some limitations to this ability. Not every Claudite had the skill or concentration necessary to change their appearance. Also, wearing heavy armor might affect this ability as well. The process was also said to be very painful for a Claudite to maintain. Also, any break in their concentration could lead to their disguise falling apart. Most Claudite shapeshifters actually had a pretty intense skincare routine. As you can imagine, there's quite a lot of stretching and pulling, especially in the facial region, when they change. Claudite assassins also spent a considerable amount of time preparing and researching for a role in order to improve their chances of a successful infiltration. Such skills came at a cost, though. The Klonite people were originally from the planet of Zolon. Thousands of years ago, their home planet was bombarded by cosmic radiation storms, which almost wiped out their entire species. Zolander scientists experimented with volunteers and accidentally activated a dormant skin-changing gene in their DNA, which resulted in the creation of the Claudites. Unfortunately for the Claudites, the Zolanders were a very religious and conservative species, and they saw the newly formed Claudites as impure and shunned them from society. 
Unlike the Norgir or the Claudites, the Tweetlings didn't possess any special physical ability that made it easier for them to become assassins. As a matter of fact, besides some minor physical features and skin pigmentation, the Tweetlings were basically humans with head tentacles, which means average strength, average agility, and average speed. Their home planet of Ryloth was a pretty harsh place though. It had a variety of different genomes from equatorial jungles to turbulent volcanoes and extremely windy valleys and highlands. Extreme weather plagued the planet along with a variety of large, dangerous animals. Most Wilix lived in caves underground for safety reasons. Now, Ryloth lacked much in valuable natural resources or industry, and therefore the main exports off the planet were actually Twi'lek servants and slaves, along with spice. The Twi'leks were therefore stigmatized across the entire galaxy as criminals and lower class aliens, while the men usually ended up working as slaves in spice mines or enforcers for crime cartels. The women were known for their beauty and usually worked as servants and dancers. Trained from a young age to manipulate and seduce other species, female Twi'leks oftentimes used their lower position in society and their docile nature to put clients at ease before striking them down. Many Imperial officers and officials met their unfortunate end in a Ryloth brothel or club. Twi'leks could also communicate with one another by using their Leku, which was more or less undetectable by outsiders. This is why when the Empire took over, they made most of the Twi'leks wear head caps so that they could not communicate this way. Many Twi'leks would serve as undercover agents for various galactic governments throughout history because of their ability to blend in with the lower rungs of society. The Kuzo were from the Outer Rim world known as Fatrang, which was also a high-gravity world. As a result, the Kuzo evolved with incredibly dense muscle fibers that made them faster and much stronger than your average being. Unlike most species from high-gravity worlds, the Kuzo were still quite lanky and tall, giving them additional reach and leverage when it came to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. Combined with heightened reflexes, the Kuzo could even spar with the Force user and come out on top. Because of the unique makeup of their homeworld's atmosphere, the Kuzo usually had to wear rebreathers and corrective lenses over their eyes to function normally. Still, it was a small price to pay for their enhanced physical abilities. Although the Kuzo regularly served as mercenaries and bounty hunters, they also routinely served as law enforcement officers and security officers. Their culture had a very strong sense of justice and honor, and a contract or oath with a Kuzo was basically unbreakable. The Kuzo would occasionally take on assassination missions, but only if they found the target worthy. The Kuzo were quite political in nature, which meant that their homeworld was broken up into a variety of different nations, all of which were ruled by one coalition government. The Kuzo also had a very martial culture, which meant that it was very common to have massive tournaments of skill. The Kuzo could easily be recognized by their wide-brimmed war helmets, which they oftentimes utilized as shields in combat. The Kuzo were quite skilled marksmen, but also adept at using a wide variety of melee weapons as well. The Witches of Doth Mary are an interesting all-female warrior race. Oftentimes called the Nice Sisters, these four sensitives were schooled in the ancient practice of Force Alchemy, which more or less had been forgotten by both the Sith and the Jedi thanks to their thousands of years of conflict. Led by the powerful witch Mother Talzin, the Night Sisters rarely left their home world or found employment off-world. The Night Sisters were loyal to Dothmir and served Mother Talzin and did her bidding. Many of their Force abilities were actually enhanced by a magical ichor that existed on the planet itself. The witches could harness this power, which would allow them to create shadow duplicates and even reanimate the dead. They were also able to use this Iker to possess other individuals and large animals like Rancors. When Mother Talzin declared war against Count Dooku, she sent several Night Sisters to assassinate the Dark Lord, and she used her magic to make them almost invisible. This ability to turn into ghostly apparitions greatly enhanced the Night Sisters' stealth abilities and made them terrific at infiltrating enemy compounds. The Night Sisters utilized handcrafted energy bows that fired plasma projectiles. Although they couldn't fire as fast as a blaster, they were equally as deadly. And the drawstring was made out of plasma as well, so they could be deadly in close range combat. Lastly, I would like to mention two other groups that are commonly deployed as assassins. First, you have droids, who aren't a species, but nonetheless, they are both well-suited and commonly deployed as assassins. Whether it's IG-88 with his multiple photoreceptors, swiveling torso, or dual-wielding capabilities, or HK-47, a lovable droid designed specifically to hunt Jedi down, or the evil version of C-3PO, R and R2-D2, Triple Zero, and BT-1, Droids can always easily be modified with offenses, defenses, and gadgets that make their killing jobs much easier. Droids are also incredibly useful for infiltration because they basically are found almost everywhere in the galaxy maintaining infrastructure and machinery or serving organics. 
The other group that is oftentimes employed as assassins in this galaxy is the humans. Although we don't have any special gifts or physical abilities to help us excel in this profession, humans are one of the most common species in the galaxy, which helps us blend in and make connections. We're also known for our ambition, tenacity, and creativity, three important traits that helps create a good assassin. So guys, if you're either looking for an assassin or oftentimes find yourself at the end of an assassination attempt, I hope this list really helps you identify which species make better assassins. Well guys, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.